This is going to be our sixth and final lecture for Module 2. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about equipment grounding and equipment grounding conductors as they pertain to Article 250. Our objectives for this lecture, we're going to identify the NEC requirements for equipment grounding, identify NEC requirements for equipment grounding conductors, list acceptable types of equipment grounding conductors, and use table 250.122 to size grounding conductors. For definitions, a grounding conductor, equipment, or an equipment grounding conductor, the conductive path or paths that provide a ground fault current path and connects normally non-current carrying metal parts of equipment together and to the system grounded conductor or to the grounding electroconductor or both. Uh, essentially, you can think of an equipment grounding conductor as the conductor connecting equipment or normally non-current carrying metal parts of different pieces of equipment to the grounding system. And equipment, a general term including fittings, devices, appliances, luminaires, apparatus, machinery, and the like used as part of or in connection with an electrical installation. Uh, so typically when we think equipment, a lot of people's minds kind of default to maybe a conveyor line or a motor, you know, something like that. But when we're talking about it by the electrical definition, it essentially is anything that is connected uh, to or is part of the electrical installation. So anything that connects to the electrical system in any way is defined as a piece of equipment. Starting off here at Article 250, we're going to be taking a look at Part 6, which is Equipment Grounding and Equipment Grounding Conductors. An equipment grounding conductor must be connected to exposed, normally non-current carrying metal parts of equipment that are supplied by or house electrical conductors under any of the following. So if any of the following conditions exist, we have to have an equipment grounding con conductor there to equip connect to that equipment where within eight feet vertically or five feet horizontally of ground or grounded metal that may be contacted by a person. Uh, and this is kind of typically the definition I go by of likely to be energized. So is it within five feet, if it's within this distance of a conductor, a current carrying conductor, I personally typically consider that likely to become energized. Um, but as far as this scenario, this is the actual definition of when we have to use equipment grounding conductor. We're not isolated in, in a damp or wet location. We're electrically contacting metal. We're in hazardous locations and we're supplied by a method that provides an equipment grounding conductor other than is permitted by 250.86 exception two. So under any of these conditions, we have to connect that piece of equipment to an equipment grounding conductor and equipment operating at 150 volts to ground, at over 150 volts to ground. So talking about our equipment grounding here for specific equipment, exposed normally non-current carrying metal parts of equipment listed in 250.112A through M must be connected to an equipment grounding conductor. So regardless of whether it meets any of those requirements we previously talked about, if it is listed in 250.112A through M, it has to be connected to an equipment grounding conductor. Exposed normally non-current carrying metal parts of cord connected equipment must be connected to an equipment grounding conductor under any of the following conditions. So once again, regardless of whether it's a piece of equipment in 250.112A through M, and regardless of whether it meets any of the criteria we previously talked about, if it's supplied by a cord, uh, it has to be grounded under any of these conditions, where it's in a hazardous location, where it's operating at over 150 volts to ground, and spec specified equipment for residential and non-residential occup occupancies. So we talked about the uh, circumstances where we have to have an equipment grounding conductor and specific equipments that require equipment grounding conductors and situations and all that. So now we're gonna talk about what we can actually use as an equipment grounding conductor when we run into those situations or those pieces of equipment. 
So th these are the types permitted of equipment grounding conductors. All the following are acceptable for use as an equipment grounding conductor. So any of these that we have listed here, we can use as an equipment grounding conductor. A copper, aluminum, or copper clad conductor of the wire or bus bar type, RMC or rigid metal conduit, IMC or intermediate metallic conduit, EMT or electrical metallic tubing, listed FMC or flexible metal conduit under specific conditions, listed liquid type conduit under specific conditions, and cable tray per 392.10 and 392.60. Um, now for these specific uh, requirements and conditions, you can go to 250.118 in your code and read more on that. Um, it's a lot of very specific information that I didn't want to overload uh, this lecture with, but just so that you are aware, it is suitable, it is allowable assuming you meet those specific conditions and other listed metal raceways. So any type of metal raceway that is listed as suitable for an equipment grounding conductor, we can use as an equipment grounding conductor. Now that we know what we have to connect to and where we have to connect to with an equipment grounding conductor, we know what we can use as an equipment grounding conductor. Now we need to know how do we identify an equipment grounding conductor or how do we have to identify it. Equipment grounding conductors may be bare, covered, or insulated. Insulated conductors must be continuously green or green with one or more yellow stripes. Conductors with green or green with yellow stripe insulation cannot be used for ungrounded or grounded circuit conductors. In other words, the only type of insulated conductor we can use as an equipment grounding conductor is a green or green with a yellow stripe conductor, and we can't use a green or green with a yellow stripe conductor for anything but an equipment grounding conductor. Uh, the only exception we have to that is that for equipment grounding conductors for AWG and larger, it may be identified as an equipment grounding conductor at both ends and every accessible location at the time of its installation. The identification must encircle the conductor and must be accomplished by one of the following. So similar to back when we talked about our grounded conductors, the way we can use, you know, I mentioned using a white or gray electrical tape to identify it at its terminations. Uh, here we have for equipment grounded conductors, we can do the same thing. However, we do have the added rule of at every accessible location. It also has to be marked. Uh, meaning if we have it installed at a, in a cable tray or in a junction box, it also has to be marked at those points as well. And it also has specific ways that we have to identify it, which are the following. Uh, stripping the insulation from the entire exposed length, so essentially making it a bare conductor, coloring the insulation green, or marking the insulation with green tape or labels. Uh, so these are the only ways we're allowed to identify that as an equipment grounding conductor. Moving on from that, talking about the size of the equipment grounding conductors, we've talked about these other factors about it. Wire type equipment grounding conductors may not be smaller than as shown in table 250.122. In no situation is an equipment grounding conductor required to be larger than the supply conductors or the ungrounded conductors. Cable tray, raceway, and cable armor must comply with 250.4A5 or B4. Where ungrounded conductors are increased in size from the minimum size required for the intended installation, if a wire type equipment grounded conductor is used, it must be increased in proportion to the ungrounded conductors according to the circular mill area of the ungrounded conductors. So a lot of information here. Main takeaways for our first bullet point are, we have to size equipment and grounding conductors using table 250.122, and regardless of any type of situation, they never have to be larger than the ungrounded conductors. For our second point here, it's telling us if for whatever reason, we have to upsize the ungrounded conductors. Uh, we'll be going over, the, over upsizing conductors for various reasons in a later uh, lecture, in a later module. Uh, but for instance, just uh, for the sake of argument, if we're having to increase them due to voltage drop, so we're using 
We're supplying a 20 amp piece of equipment with a normally 20 amp size rated ungrounded circuit conductor. And we have to increase it from say a number 12 to a number 10 due to voltage drop. We have to increase the equipment grounding conductors of that circuit proportionally. And I have an example of doing that. Now it is a little bit advanced beyond the scope of this uh, course. You won't be required to do this for your exam or anything like that. However, it's something that I see overlooked a lot in the field. So something I wanted to make sure you all were aware of and at least had some idea of how to go about doing it. So here's our example of uh, how we would go about doing uh, that upsize in the equipment grounding conductor. So we have a minimum size circuit conductor required as a number six AWG copper with a 40 amp overcurrent protective device, but for whatever reason, we have to increase that to a number four copper conductor. As I said before, it could be due to voltage drop, it could be to having more than three current carrying conductors in the same raceway, it could be to, due to the ambient temperature. There are a couple different factors that could do it, but for whatever reason, we had to increase from a number six copper to a number four copper. A number six copper has an conductor has an equivalent circular mill of 26,240 circular mills. A number four cop, uh, gauge conductor has 41,740 circular mills. So we do that out and we see that we had to increase that conductor by 159%. Table 250.122 a normal equipment grounding conductor size for this circuit would be a number 10 AWG copper conductor. We see that a number 10 AWG copper conductor is 10,380 circular mils. When we increase that 10,380 circular mils by 159%, we get 16,504 circular mils. After we do some checking, we see that the next size closest to that being more than 16,504 circular mils, because it can't be less than, would be a number eight equipment grounding conductor, which is 16,510 circular mils. So as I said before, essentially whatever percentage you increase the ungrounded conductor size by, you have to increase the equipment grounding conductor size by that much as well. And this is an example of doing how you would actually go about doing that. And now here we have the actual table, 250.122, which is the minimum size equipment grounding conductor for grounding raceway and equipment. So the way we use this table is on the left-hand column, the rating or setting of automatic overcurrent device in the circuit ahead of the equipment, conduit, et cetera, not exceeding amperes. In other words, what size is your overcurrent protected device? That is actually what determines the size of your equipment grounding conductor. It's not based on the load of the, uh, that you're supplying. It's not based on the size of the ungrounded circuit conductors. It's actually based on the size of your overcurrent protected device. On the right-hand side, you have your size, AWG or KC mill in copper, for one column and aluminum or copper clad aluminum for another column. So if we look at a typical branch circuit in a residential application is a 15 amp circuit, we see on our left hand column 15 amps. And if we're using a copper equipment grounding conductor, that would be a number 14 copper equipment grounding conductor for that circuit. Now say we're using, we're doing a 200 amp a feeder circuit to a garage from the main build from the residential building we have a 200 amp overcurrent protected device protecting that feeder circuit we go to 200 amps on our left hand column and we go straight across and we get a number six copper equipment grounding conductor that would be required for that feeder circuit it's also important to note doesn't matter if it's a feeder circuit or a branch circuit it still remains the same. It's based on the overcurrent protected device. And that concludes our final lecture for module two. In our next session, we're gonna be starting off in module three with article 300 general requirements.